over 70% of people between 18 and 25 or something along those lines suffered from mental health challenges. If they're your superiors, what do you do? Who do you talk to? Because, uh, you know, instinctively I would say, have you spoken to anyone? Speak to the superior. But what, what if the problem is with that person? I've worked 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week. I've worked shifts of 32 hours with very little rest or sleep. <laughs> I like the face. Welcome to the She Word, conversations that women rarely have, but really should. I am your host, Trudy Kerr. So first of all, like I have done for the three weeks before this, I'm just gonna remind you, you see that button down here somewhere that says subscribe? Do click on that. Make sure you subscribe, you follow, or you like the She Word because we have so much coming up. Not just in this season of the She Word, in the Young Women's Edition, Women in Business, the He Word is coming up as well. Make sure that you get involved. It's really easy. There's a button just under here, says subscribe, just click on it right now. And if you're watching this before anybody else because you're a Patreon subscriber, a huge Huge thanks and welcome to you. Just by subscribing to Patreon, not only do you receive notifications of special deals, special offers with our partners, not only do you get all of the content before anybody else and content that's not available to anybody else, not only are you going to be invited to live events first before anyone else with a very special invitation, but on top of that, just by subscribing to Patreon, you also are making a difference because 50% of our profits of our Patreon page goes towards the Richmond Foundation to support women who cannot afford therapy or guidance and we're so grateful to have that opportunity to do that. This show is revisiting the theme of mental health but this time it's in the context of the workplace. The average person will spend 90,000 hours at work over a lifetime. And whilst we can choose our friends and our life partners, whilst we can make decisions regarding family and our downtime, the workplace is often an aspect of our life that is beyond our direct control. A comprehensive 2022 workplace survey found that 92% of employees experience mental health challenges that impacts on their work. I'm also extremely excited because I have three incredible and amazing ladies joining me for this show. First of all, Claire Borch. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm going to get you to fill in the gaps in a minute, but I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction. You're joining us from this Richmond Foundation relationship, and I'm so thrilled that you're here. You're a psychotherapist and the co-founder at Indigo Psychology Services Malta, but you've also worked at Hospice Malta, you've been a lecturer, you've worked with the Foundation for Social Welfare Services, and you work in private practice as a psychotherapist. Now, if I've missed anything out, we'll come to you in just That's a second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Nicole. Wow. Nicole is a foundation doctor and aspiring psychiatrist at Matadea. You have a passion for mental health, physical burnout, neo-divergence? Neo Neurodivergence. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. I'm going to be asking you about what that is in, in just a few minutes. But all things research. Uh, you also believe very strongly in mental health and the burnout crisis facing the medical profession. Uh, and this is what is has brought you and your colleague Maria to being committed to climbing uh, the to the Everest base camp to bring awareness to this cause. And Fran, Fran Moise, who's back on the show for the second time, a solopreneur, a headhunter and talent advisor, working with a plethora of inspiring women professionals, but also a working mother from a and, and bringing everything here to the table from a 
personal perspective. You're also joining us with decades of experience in evaluating work environments and the challenges that come with them. Thank you so much for being back here for a second time. And just as an aside, the first time you're on the show, my goodness, you you got a fan base, Fran. <laughs> so we're going to come to you in a second, but just coming back around the table, Claire, did I miss anything out? Well, I'm not sure, to be honest, because I've worked in so many different places at this point. Um, I'm very passionate about mental health. So I've always tried to um, grab on to different opportunities to meet new people, to be challenged and um, to grow personally, professionally. So, yes, there might be a bit more. But to be honest, I can't even remember them myself. <laughs> that will do for the time being. Yes. Uh, it's really good to have you on the show. And of course, we do have this beautiful relationship with the Richmond Foundation. Yes. So a, a huge thank you for everything that you do there as well. One thing that came out of this show is just, you know, we're talking about these topics, but we want to be able to provide support for women who need it. Uh, so thank you for that. Nicole, apart from all of the training that obviously went into this incredible feat, have I missed anything out as well? Um, no, I think that's mostly it. I mean, now I'm about to start psychiatry training, so I'm I'm quite excited for that. And I run Mental Health of Medics, which is an organization. I, it's not an official organization, but we're in the process of it becoming an NGO, um, which aims to raise awareness on the mental health of doctors and medical students in Malta. Now, when you even went out onto social media talking about this, suddenly I thought to myself, oh my word. This is a massive area that we need to talk about because when we have something wrong with us, we go to the medical profession. But of course, mm. there is a, a hit on the medical profession just by the fact that we're going to you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really interested to find out more about that and everything that you are committed to, to bringing to the forefront. And, and again, wow, and a massive thank you for that. Fran... Did I miss anything out? And and you are, just to put it in context, you're not Maltese. Nope. So to remind our audience again, where are you from? Why are you here? So originally from Romania. Today I'm here because you invited me. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm incredibly honoured so to be back again on the show and, you know, to, to talk about with these wonderful ladies. You know, their achievements are impressive and their background. So I'm, I'm looking forward to learn more about it. Um, so yes, I moved to Malta, I think, almost almost 10 years ago, towards the end of this, this year. I moved here from London and yeah, settled here. I like it a lot. Um, so yeah. And one heck of an outspoken lady, if you don't mind me saying, because yeah, that was... And then. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen the show Women in the Workplace from season two, go back and see it. Uh, we had Amber, Fran and Sara uh, Grek on the show and, and real powerful incredibly empowering show for a lot of women you just saying exactly what needs to be said and of course that's what the show is all about so thank you ladies we're having this incredibly important conversation about mental health in the workplace and I'm going to run some statistics by us to put this in context of why we're having this conversation so 58% of women in Malta work 67.8% uh, of women around the world work, 50.7% of the workforce in the US, for instance, are women. And it's statistically proven that women are assigned 10% more work than men. They achieve the same completion rate uh, as their male counterparts, suggesting that they are more industrious. And it would be assumed that women would be equal to their male peers in the workplace. Now, we're not going to talk about male versus female, but just to put it in context, there's a lot of women at work. One in 6.8 people experience mental health problems in the workplace. That's 14.7%. Women in full-time employment are nearly twice as likely to have common mental health problems as full-time employed men. The most common mental health issues that my research was able to find is anxiety, depression, and stress. Statistics reveal that 60% of the working professionals experience at least mild symptoms of anxiety, and one in four meet the threshold for clinically relevant symptoms of anxiety. And 38% of women have experienced harassment in the workplace as well. 
I found these statistics staggering. I think most profoundly, one in four have suffered or are suffering clinically registered anxiety. And it causes me to think back over my own work life experience, which has been substantially long. And so I may have dismissed some of the challenges that I have personally faced, not getting paid, not getting paid on time, discrimination, unfair dismissal, redundancy, uncertainty of no job security, sexual harassment, 60 to 70 hour working weeks, and very frequent issue of bullying, and many more issues that I personally have dismissed because that's what we do. We dismiss these issues. So in your own words, I've said the statistics, I've read the statistics, <coughs> but I, in your own words, how impactful is the workplace on our mental well-being? I'm going to start with you, Claire. Yes, very impactful, because as you said, we spend so many hours there every day. Um, it becomes part of our life, our identity. So most people would say, hi, I'm Claire, and they would then say what they do. So um, this is a part of us and who we are. So if we are unhappy at work or if we're not being treated well, then that will not just affect our time at work, but even how we see ourselves, our identity, how we relate to the world as well. Wow, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> that was an epic start to the show. <laughs> yes, of course, it's your identity. Uh, Fran, uh, what are your thoughts on that? What, how is the, the workplace important with regards to, to mental health and well-being? I, I agree with Claire. We spend significant time in our life at work, um, you know, at, particularly during the working week. The majority of the yeah. working week is spent at work and very often given the demands of in general business demands today uh, whether warranted or not we can talk about that later we tend to also bring that home whether we continue working a little bit from home or we think about it or it's so intense that it does not allow us to disconnect mm -hmm. from the moment we get home um, and yes it is true we we have somehow um, identified our careers with our persona and you know th I think this is something we can talk about a lot to start making that distinction that you know your job essentially does not define you mm -hmm. so if we start working towards that to hopefully improve our ability to separate the two as much as possible to make it more comfortable for us so we can disconnect from the pressure and not continue to carry it home well, all the time, because I think it's hard to disconnect mm. completely, but at least reduce it. Yeah. You both mentioned something that immediately <clears throat> has really struck me, because if I looked at my social media profile, what am I going to say? I'm a presenter. I'm a <clears throat> podcaster. I'm a, that's my role. That's my job. And I'm very fortunate and blessed to be able to have this job. But you look at most people, and most people on social media are going to say that they're... <laughs> These days, probably content creator, and then they're <laughs> going to say <laughs> influencer, and then they're going to say that they do something else. But we do, we define. I've never even thought of that. So if you aren't having a good time with your career or your role, then that impacts you to every part of your being. Nicole, I'm coming to you to ask the same question about mental health in the workplace. But of course you, I mean, this is this whole show and why we're emphasizing mental health really is because of you, because you are taking these steps to bring awareness to the medical profession. And as I said, if the medical profession is suffering, then we are all in big doo-doos yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's the medical profession that we turn to to support us. But yeah. specifically with regards to, I'm going to start off talking about specifics, with regards to the medical mm -hmm. profession, what are we seeing as challenges to mental health and why? Sure. So I think one of the main challenges when it comes to doctors and medical professionals is that the long working hours and the conditions which we work in. I've worked 80 hours a week, 90 hours a week. I've worked shifts of 32 hours with very little rest or sleep. <laughs> I like the face. Um, oh, yes. sorry, sorry. I do those faces. Yes. Um, 32 hours. Yes, yeah, so you go into work at 7.45 on Monday and you get out of work on, at 2.30 p.m. on Tuesday. 
and it's quite it's quite a routine thing. So you, you can have two or three of these 32-hour shifts a week, which piles up obviously the hours, and that coupled with the stress of the job. So your pager is constantly ringing. Maybe there is a, an emergency in the ward. You're dealing with death and dying and a lot of loss and trage tragedy in 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 the medical profession, and you have to keep going. So it's a lot of like you constantly have to keep going. You constantly have to show up for your patients. And because of that, we forget that we're people too. We're human. And if I hadn't, if I haven't peed in 10 hours, I probably should go do that. If I hadn't had anything to drink at all these, these past 12 hours, I probably should have something to drink. So we suppress our needs. And then with, when you suppress your physical health, your sleep, then obviously mental health problems are more, much more likely to show up. Apart from that, with regards to identity, I think it's a super important point for us. Like for me, being a doctor, I think a, a huge part of who I am. I, I can't quantify it in terms of a percentage because it's such a huge part. And it's sometimes it's difficult to remember that I am more than a doctor, but I am more than a doctor. I have many other things. But if you just reduce it to being a doctor, then it's easy for your, jo your job, your work to encompass everything. So... Yeah. But that's that applies just as you were saying. That applies to to any role. I mean, okay. So I'm going to do a poll around the table just <laughs> to put that into context, mm -hmm. and we're going to come back to those challenges that you just mentioned because I have a feeling that those workplace challenges that you mentioned may be more intense mm -hmm. in under your situation. But I'm fairly sure that they are not exclusive, and Fran probably has a better idea. But but just as a just as a kind of <laughs> poll around the table. Your profile, whether it be LinkedIn or whether it be, I mean, LinkedIn, you would expect there to be your profession to be written on there. But with regards to social media, to, to Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever, maybe not TikTok, but would, would you say your profession, do you have that listed? I actually do. <laughs> yes, she does. I'm, I'm thinking about it because... Obviously, I, I wouldn't want to come across as a snob, but <laughs> I love what I do. And I love the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've worked in different areas. But at the same time, I acknowledge that there was a period in my life where that was the only thing that I was doing. So my friends and family would joke about me, you know, moving from one job to another every couple of years. Um, and they would say, this is like your hobby in a way. And it's true. It's my passion. So it's um, when I'm in my free time, I end up reading things about psychology, psychotherapy. But now I have been trying to do other things and I am involved in other things. I have different roles. But it's very close to my heart. So, so I, I would your want profile. to talk about it. Yes. Fran, is it on your profile? Yes. Okay. And it's on your profile. Okay. Yep. So exactly that. We started off by, and, and yes, yes, it's on mine. So we started off by acknowledging that it really is a huge part of who we are. So we identified, no, Nicole, you identified those long hours and, and, you know, I thought I was doing pretty good with, you know, having done 60 to 70 hour weeks. I feel very silly now, can I just say. Um, but those issues that you mentioned, long hours, putting yourself last, you know, not going yeah. even for a pee or getting a drink. Fran, from your point of view, are these challenges that then translate into other careers that you see? They do, um, not necessarily to the extent that you have described, you know, so primarily I deal a lot with professional work as professional services within the office setup. And, you know, if we are to compare like for like, then when it comes, if you look just at the pure number of hours, it's not as severe. Um, but then there are other challenges, but like you said, they're not exclusive, maybe not as, you know, um, say strong as they exist in the medical mm -hmm. sector due to the nature of the industry and the lack of resources, perhaps. But it's not exclusive. So, you know, um, people do um, have challenges with high pressure demands and stress and you know, the ability to cope with that has also diminished over time. I found our ability to cope with stress, to cope with adversity and challenges has decreased over time. Um, I think, you know, even from one generation to, to another. That, that's wow! A generation I've 
I really? I, I'm not sure if there's any particular studies that have been conducted with regards well, to that. Claire's the one that's nodding there. <laughs> Claire's nodding frantically. I'm nodding because I'm interested, but I'm not sure. If I'm there not is sure a... if there's any like particular studies that have been conducted on this. But if we look at um, the, the challenges experienced today, put in the context of work, life and mm. everything. Um, I mean, theoretically, we live in our best times in the sense that we have medication for diseases. We have shelters. There, there is help. There were times throughout history that we had none of this. So from a comfort point of view, it has improved significantly. But then our ability to deal with stress and adversity has diminished. Maybe if we look at, there was a, um, a survey conducted in Malta that I believe it said over 70% of people between 18 and 25 or something along those lines suffered from mental health challenges, particularly related to depression and, and, and anxiety. Um, and I speak with a lot of, of young people, not, not in many cases, not young, not much younger than I am, uh, for example, that s struggle a lot to cope with conversation, with criticism, and and you know, if I look back and how we are and my gener and the generation before, we had a different approach towards things. So maybe that's something as well to. What if you could start your journey over, start here and start again there? That's how life works in a circular way. We understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. Seguendo la strada sommersa di fronte all'isola di Mozia, Superando le storiche saline all'interno della riserva orientata dello stagnone di Marsala, dove il vento anima e trasporta, ti troverai tra distese di vigneti e misteriose tracce di antiche civiltà. Luoghi in cui la luce domina il tempo, caricando di calore e di colore la natura e gli uomini. Gli uomini, i nostri uomini. Ci siamo chiesti cosa rendesse davvero speciale tutto questo. In una parola, il carattere. Il carattere di una terra amata e combattuta. Il carattere di chi lavora in vigna e in cantina. Il carattere della famiglia. Il carattere di un frutto. E tutto questo è frutto del nostro carattere. throw something at you that as you were talking about that that just occurred to me from the first show in this season three I was talking to uh to Martina um Danita and Denise and we were talking about how the role of women has changed and it's only you know post-war that women went out to work pre-war that was it was specifically without wanting to sound classes, but it would have been working class and low working class women that went out to work, middle working class and, and upwards women didn't work. So you had a completely different dynamic at home. And I'm wondering whether that could potentially have some impact on what we're talking about mental health. You're saying that people can't cope, but maybe it's because when they get home, they don't have the relief from the stress yes, yes, and they're yes, walking yes, into a new stress. I mean, I'm just talking from the top of my head. <laughs> you guys are the medics and you're the, 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 <laughs> the workplace profession. So tell me, but it, maybe it might be something that, that could play a role. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with you in the sense that I don't think we're becoming less resilient. I think the opposite. I think the demands have increased so much 
that we're not coping, not because we're less resilient, but because the demands are much, much greater. Mm. Even the, the thing of when I get home, I have things to do at home. So plus the work pressure is also higher. Like if my CV before had to have two things, now it has to have six things because the people who are applying for the same job have five things. So obviously I want to be better mm. to get the job. And in fairness to, to Fran, she didn't, I'm just going to say, you didn't say less resilient. You said we weren't coping as well. Yes, Claire, you're the expert. Are we not coping as well as we used to? I don't think so. Um, uh, and as Nicole is saying, we have so much to keep up with. And even though I appreciate the fact that, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman and I'm working, but I, when I look at uh, my relatives and when I look at my mother and my grandparents and my aunts, um, they weren't doing what I am doing. They were living a completely different life. And I found myself asking whether I can do it because I haven't actually witnessed it. Um, so I, I think to myself and I say, how am I going to do this and do that? I, I mean, who am I to be able to juggle different roles and my work and, you know, my work-life balance? Um, and I, I think back and I, as I said, I look at my relatives and I say, but how fulfilled were they? But was it stressful or not? I'm sure it was stressful, but it was a different kind of stress. Did they have the necessary help that uh, they would have needed? So I'm not sure. I just think about it very often. But I don't know what I would choose. I would probably still choose to live the life that I'm living right now. But at the same time, um, it's hard. It's very difficult. Well, like I say, we had this conversation in the very first show. Um, I think it was Danica who was saying, uh, sorry, I think it was Danita that was saying that uh, she was being required to be, uh, or, or it was society required her to be a social media content creator, to work, to to be a wife, to be interesting, to be a mother, and also a goddess in the bedroom. I mean, it really, the pressures are incredible right now, and and whether it's relevant or not, but social media also tells you you should be all of those things as well. What are the common issues that are facing employees in the workplace, just to put this in context, that could impact on mental health? And I'm going to start off with you, Nicole, because you mentioned long hours of work. You mentioned not being able to go for a pee and you mentioned not being able to go for a drink and these sorts of things. But there must be more common issues than that. I mean, one thing that comes to mind immediately is probably stigma. I think <laughs> with regards to stigma, as in it's something that if I go and disclose a mental health problem, there is a risk that my employer is going to say that I may not be good enough for the job because of said mental health problem. If I go to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, what if someone finds out and they'll, you know, they'll start rumors about me, they'll say I'm not a good worker, not a good doctor. So I think stigma is a major Impact. Hang on a second. <laughs> you work in the men you work in medical field. Yeah. <laughs> and you work, as you said yourself, you're dealing with death and you're all of these issues. And if you went Nicole goes and talks to someone and says, I'm struggling with my mental health right now, you would suffer stigma. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Because the 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 sort of automatic assumption is that I'm a doctor, I can heal myself, I have to go through this, you know, and there is no way I'm going to admit to weakness, it's not weakness, but th that's the, the sort of mentality that we have, and I'm sure it's not, it's not just my, my profession for sure. Well, I agree, most <laughs> definitely. Um, and, you know, when I think about what you're saying, you, you're exposed to so much trauma and that yeah. takes a toll on your physical health, mental health. But yes, I do think that um, some people might look at helping professionals as the ones who have it all because they know what to do in a crisis. They know what to do in an emergency. So they might think that our lives are OK. You know, we know how to handle trauma <laughs> or breakups or um, how to find the best balance between you know our roles at work and our roles at home but really and truly um, we're trying to figure it <laughs> out and I do think there might be more stigma sometimes yes Fran is that right if, if someone you know in the workplace I mean you you're 
you have decades of experience of, of placing people in work situations and probably dealing with those work situations when they fall apart or they're not not you know looking out for the red flags. If someone has a, a mental health issue, if they're they're struggling, if they've gone th- if they've gone through a divorce, or they've lost their home, or they've lost a child, mm-hmm. would an employer, wouldn't a workplace say, you know, that's okay, that's fine, you you take as long as you want? And that's what you would hope, <laughs> ideally, the answer to be. Um, I think it has improved over the years significantly, particularly in the last, you know, five, three, three, five years, it has improved dramatically with the raise of awareness and more people speaking out and being more candid about their experience, more forthcoming. But um, there, there still is a certain degree of stigma, yes, still even within the professional workplace. Um, particularly for C-level executives or senior level professionals, um, that being in a leadership position, um, like you said, you know, they are afraid to show or may they, they may be concerned to show vulnerability mm-hmm. and be judged towards that. But that, of course, spirals, you know, no matter the level of work. I can see, though, you know, I never thought about the, the points you've mentioned in the medical profession how it is perceived and probably that's a lot harder to deal with as well also I think I I do agree that it has improved and stigma has improved but also if you consider serious mental illness so if you're going to employ someone and they tell you they suffer from schizophrenia they have psychotic episodes the stigma is still huge it's not the same as someone telling you I have a bit of anxiety sometimes so I I mean I'm not an employer, so I don't know, but I, I'm i 100% sure that, you know, these people are less likely to get employed because of their mental health mm-hmm. condition. What do you do in that certain, those circumstances, Fran? You just don't say it? To be honest with you, I don't know um, how, how to answer that. It's, it's not something that I would deal with on a regular basis, you know, from that interaction point of view. But I, I do know that a lot of people choose not to make that disclosure. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a personal choice depending on how it affects their their ability to, to, to work. But I can see how that it would be very difficult for someone to bring to the table, particularly mm-hmm. when they are in a position where they need assistance. And that, like you were saying, that there's a lot more competition. You're saying about the CV, you know, to add more. So that adds to the stress. So you have have the stress of the challenges you're facing for your mental health. You have the stress of the competition from having to do more, compete with more people, deliver more. And then you have the added stress on how to deliver that in a way, um, you know, that, that you will find support and whether you will find that support. So I can see how that that is very difficult. And in all honesty, you know, how would we tackle this? How would employers tackle this? I think, you know, approaching um, institutions like the Richmond Foundation to guide them in how to handle such situations and um, remaining open-minded and educating themselves and understanding the scope of the role to understand the implications because, you know, in the context that you gave, you know, certain roles perhaps may be difficult to carry, you know, from a responsibility point of view, but there are certainly roles that would you know, be very well suited and they would be able to carry and they will feel content and fulfilled and in the sense of expanding their horizon and expanding their understanding of it from institutions that can guide them with the appropriate information and also with with regards to overall awareness and support to also help them have the courage to do that as well because mm-hmm. they may be that employers themselves may lack the courage to offer that support or have that conversation because they don't know how to how to approach it. This is an amazing look at how somebody who's struggling with mental health or challenged by mental health is going to approach a workplace situation. But there is, of course, the flip side of that. And I'm staying with you, Fran, because there is quite often uh, situations where it is the workplace that challenges our mental health. And I think we talk about toxic relationships with partners and (laughs) boyfriends and husbands and wives and family members, but we don't often mention the impact of a toxic workplace or a narcissistic colleague or a boss as something that we should take seriously. And yet we spend 
90,000 hours in the workplace. And if you're in that workplace with somebody who, or a team or, or an individual who is really impacting you uh, in, a, in a way that is toxic or narcissistic or damaging or abusive, then that obviously is the flip side of it. It's not you bringing a mental health issue to the workplace. It's a mental health issue that's being being brought on you. a gift. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. There you go. Have this present. And it, it comes somewhat to what you were saying about the medical profession, yes, but I yes. want to stay with you for a second, Fran. I mean, how often, how frequent is this that you're going to find somebody working in a, in a toxic situation, a work situation? I think it's quite frequent um, in that respect. It depends how you define toxic. So if we look at the demands of the workplace, they have increased significantly, particularly due to the fact that there is some degree of expectation, whether we like to admit it or not, to be available all the time. And that is due to the development of technology and social media. So for example, if you have a group WhatsApp, uh, a WhatsApp group, or you're, I don't know, connected with your boss or a colleague on WhatsApp and, you know, and you send their messages and the two blue <laughs> ticks thing you come up. For me, I have them deactivated because you just give me anxiety. I don't want to reply, you know, but you are expected. Noted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are expected. Oh, they've seen the message. And I see comments sometimes like, you know, Franny left me on, on scene. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you, man. Just chill, <laughs> right? Um, so that's a very simplistic example, but I think you understand where I'm coming from in terms of the demand. This is why France, for example, they introduced a legislation that after a certain time, I think it was five or six, I can't remember exactly, you know, unless it's a, an emergency, you can't contact employees because there has been this constant with the rise of technology. And it has been useful in a lot of ways because you could tackle certain things very quickly. But you know, with this, we also lost the ability to distinguish between what's important what, and what's urgent. Everything is urgent now, you know, urgent reply. You know, for example, if someone doesn't reply to your email for three days, what's the first thing you think about? What oh, is something wrong? Or, you know, they don't like me. I don't know, you go down the rabbit hole. It depends what you can come up with, you know, <laughs> like pulling rabbits out of a hat, you know. So that's one. Um, and I think... Trying as much as possible, again, depends on the sector, uh, to um, have that uh, break, you know, between office and work. And, and I used to do it as well. I used to message because if something gets on my mind, I send a message so I get it off. I don't necessarily want a reply or I expect someone to do it straight away. But I didn't realize how that affected people, you know, because they were stressed, you know, a message from friend at eight, lunatic. Uh, <laughs> you know? um, and I, I didn't understand because I didn't do it with the intention of them having to do it. But when I've realized it, you know, much later, unfortunately, but anyway, uh, I saw the light. And um, if that was to happen, for example, I try, you know, and schedule it during, you know, what we would call, you know, the office hour. So a conscious effort towards this and talking about it because it's something that it has become so much part of our personality that we don't necessarily do it with a bad intention we're just used to it you know hey just saying let's talk tomorrow and it's 10 and you're thinking weird but, you, but let's say for instance coming back to the to the original issue about toxicity and or mm -hmm. and you know narcissistic colleague or whatever if that person I, I mean I hadn't even thought about this availability thing and I guess I'm coming to you Claire but if that if that toxic person has access to you in your safe space which is your home at your safe time which is out of work hours you have no protection from them so coming from your point of view what I mean you as a as a, a therapist must see a lot of this Yes, in fact, a lot of clients during COVID were telling me this, that they couldn't distinguish between their safe space at home and their workspace because most people were working from home. So this happens with colleagues as well. If we have a group chat um, and I'm receiving messages and maybe it's a chat that we use for banter, but if I say something and my colleagues um, pick on me or, I don't know, they don't laugh at my joke, this is all 
also something that I'll be carrying with me in my free time on my sofa and my safe space. Um, so yes, definitely, there is no escape sometimes. And clients do feel this, they do talk to me a lot about it and um, they wonder whether they would be rude if they don't join in the conversation because it's become very common to talk to colleagues outside of work. I mean, I have to say I'm kind of old school and I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> phone goes over there and I, I just ignore it. I and that's not a bad thing because it helps you to keep that, like you said, that separation as well. But coming back to your urgency, you know, I had somebody requesting for me to do something for them and I didn't reply to them in two hours because we were filming. And when I went back to that message, there was a panic. I'm sorry, are, are we doing this? Are we not doing this? Hang on a second. I might be busy. Right. And and. A, Having said that, this is a recent lesson for me, and it comes to boundaries. It comes to me saying, this is my boundary. I don't need to reply to you. And a, a dear friend of, me, a friend of mine once said to me, if it's important, if it's that important, you'll pick up the phone mm -hmm. and you'll actually make that call. And of course, that's one of the things that we don't do. We hide behind messaging, thinking that messaging has the same impact. Nicole, we're coming to this in the context of the, of the medical profession in a second, but just coming back to you, Claire, this toxicity, this, this uh, you know, toxic work environment, toxic bosses, narcissists, you know, anything, whatever term that you want to use, is this something that you deal with? Is this something that you see frequently? Yes, unfortunately. And I would say we talk a lot about um, abusive relationships yeah. outside of work, but some relationships at work are abusive. There is no other word to use. Um, and the problem is that if they're your superiors, what do you do? Who do you talk to? Because... Uh, you know, instinctively, I would say, have you spoken to anyone? Speak to the superior. But what what if the problem is with that person, the, the person who's next in line? Um, and it takes a toll, definitely, because um, clients tell me, you know, they wake up in the morning feeling anxious, driving to work, crying, not even knowing how they got to the workplace. So it's it's unsafe as well. Um, and they would just try to get through the day. I have clients telling me they go to the bathroom at work to cry as well. So uh, if you feel like there's nothing you can do, um, like most people feel in abusive relationships, then that will definitely take a toll on a person's mental health. And sometimes I feel like we justify certain behavior just because it's at work. So I would tell a friend to leave their partner if I think they're being abused. But would I tell them to leave their workplace because, I don't know, what about the perks and what will you do? Or maybe that's because, you know, the person in charge has to maintain some sort of authority or whatever. So I think um, we justify it more. don't we? We accept behavior in the workplace that we'd never put up with from our yeah. partners or our parents or our friends. You know, we talked on this show recently about breaking up with friends, that being as important as breaking up with, with partners or, or making space between yourself and your family if we find that to be toxic. But we, I mean, this is why we're having this conversation because good grief, you know, if you spend 90,000 hours doing it and that is not a healthy uh, situation, that's going to impact on you as much as any other scenario. 
Coming back to you, Nicole, I mean, you're really advocating for, for mental health from the medical profession. I'm going to keep grilling you <laughs> because I'm going to keep coming back and saying, you know, you talked about the stigma, you've yeah. talked about the long hours, you've talked about facing the trauma. Is there anything else that we're missing out on? Is there, it, you know, when you look at people that are under that amount of pressure, surely at some point after 32 hours, you're going to have a short fuse and you're going to say something that you probably shouldn't say to somebody just because you're a bit pissed off. Yeah. Um, what you mentioned is actually something I've seen like almost every day when I worked at the emergency department. So I'd be working with, with people who are very nice, generally very, very good, very helpful in terms of colleagues. But then everyone's so stressed. There's so many patients to see. There's so many patients who are very unwell that everyone's shouting and the communication just breaks down. So at that point, it's like someone may have said something which they wouldn't have normally said to me. I would feel bad about it. I would feel bad about myself. And they wouldn't... Maybe they wouldn't have meant it or they wouldn't have meant it in that way. But at that point, it's going to affect me and, and my function in, in the workplace. So, yes, uh, stress impacts communication. Absolutely. And that's not <laughs> that's not just for, for the, obviously, for the medical pro profession. I'm looking at you, Fran, because you, know, you work with sea levels. You mentioned sea levels. Sea levels have a great deal of responsibility. Anybody in... in in that level of, of, of any field is going to be under an awful lot of pressure. So that communication, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we also, forgetting toxic colleagues and narcissists and all that aside for a second, but when any, anyone is under pressure, absolutely. it can bring out the worst in us, right? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And at, like the example you gave, you know, at any point we may find ourselves that we're the one also causing this aggravation because we ourselves are under pressure. It doesn't necessarily yeah. always have to be, you know, in the in the context of a senior person and someone reporting into them. It could also be the other way around because, mm -hmm. you know, the demands are 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 strong. And if you don't have that time to disconnect, and if you don't have continuous support in terms of your productivity to help you to carry your job in the best possible way, you're going to snap at one point now. So we've all been in that situation where we've hurt someone or we've been hurt. Again, the key is also communication and, you know, addressing these things when, you know, the, the spirits have calmed down. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes even letting some things go that are minor. Again, I'm not talking here about, you know, big um, situations um, or, or things like that. Sometimes things, you know, just happen to say, look, everyone is under stress. Let's just... Mm -hmm you know, draw a line under it and move on. It could be the case of that if it's nothing major, nothing, you know, important mm -hmm. in that in that respect. Um, but it's also important to recognize that, like you, you were saying earlier, that we put up with, sometimes we put up with things in the workplace that we, we wouldn't normally put up with in our personal lives, for example. But then it's also a very different dynamic because your workplace in the sense of your job um, dictates your your income, mm. your, okay, your ability to earn. So obviously you're going to look at it from different lenses in the sense that when you decide to break that relationship, so let's say, for example, in the, in the context of immediately resigning, you know, you, of course your mind is going to go to as how am I going to survive? How will I be able to support myself? It's only normal. So when you put it in that context, then it's important then to, for everyone, as I said, to, to raise awareness, to educate and to try to improve the experience. So if a breakup <laughs> comes up, is not abrupt that it disrupts your life as well in terms of your income because we have to recognize that as well and then whether we like it or not it does influence our decision it does absolutely so that leads me to ask what should we do what can we do about workplace mental health challenges both for our <coughs> own mental health short term and for long term so if we we're finding ourselves challenged in the workplace what should we be doing yeah i think um we need to take care of our mental health everywhere every day so i would always 
no recommend for people to find things that nourish them. And um, this is not just at the workplace, but outside of the workplace as well, but even at the workplace. So if I have 30 minutes uh, break, what do I do? in those 30 minutes? Do I eat in front of my laptop? Do I go for a walk and maybe listen to a podcast um, or some guided meditation? And maybe this is not something you can do every day, right? But I think small changes can also make a difference. And then obviously there are um, other things that um, can be done by the employers and uh, the entities and institutions. But I think even on a personal level, uh, we might be able to tweak some things here and there for the betterment of our mental health. It's really interesting you say that because I was smiling and giggling <laughs> because I'm the sort of person, and I'm sure I'm not on my own at this table, but I'm the sort of person that will sit down in front of the computer at, I don't know, 8 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I've forgotten to eat, I've forgotten to take the dog for a walk, the dog is looking at me, you know, cursing, crossing <laughs> their legs because I'm so into my work. Now, I'm not facing in that context, I'm not facing any toxic relationships or anything like that, but I do realize that I've not given my brain a break. Yes. And, and I, you, you know, it's so easy to put it aside, right? And, and sorry, but you're the lady that goes 10 hours without going for a pee, for crying out loud. So, so talk to me just a little bit more before I come to these other ladies about these practical things that you can be doing. You mentioned about your lunch break, should you be in front of the computer? Well, but aren't we in a culture, Fran, aren't we in a culture where if you're the person that gets up and goes out and sits away from the computer, you'll be frowned on because you're not committed to your work. I mean... I think a couple of years back, yes. Like I said, I think it has improved. Oh, really? It still exists. It's just me, but then. it has improved. <laughs> it has improved. Uh, but, you know, what are they going to do? <laughs> just get up and go if you feel like going, if that works for you, you know, and then... Uh, you know, yeah, they might say, but you can, you know, easily reply, you know, I need, I need my break to be able to function better. If you want to reply, me being me, I wouldn't, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend not to reply <laughs> to, to that. Um, so, yeah. I had a friend uh, who was telling me that she had made a decision to look after her mental health in the workplace. And she'd made a decision that she would leave at 6.30 every evening. And she was asked by a senior in her company, what was wrong? Why are you leaving so early? Her contract was until five. And they still asked her because it was expected because she changed her behavior and she was work and she changed from work, leaving the office at eight to leaving at 6.30. What did, well, Fran, look, what do we do about that? Don't worry, Nicole, I'm coming to you because you're the woman that doesn't pee. <laughs> but what do we do about that? Well, how, I mean, seriously though, is that actually going to impact on our, our career prospects? Because I think for a lot of people, they think that it will. Yeah, I, I understand why they would think that, because I used to think that as well. Um, I was laughing when you were telling the story. I thought the reply of the boss was, so what, are you part-time? That's what we used mm -hmm. to get told. <laughs> I thought that's what he would have said. So, for yeah, example, yeah. I've, I've, you know, been in environments like that uh, in, you know, the distant, very distant past, um, where where there was this again expectation and culture of work hard, play hard, right? Um, so I can understand why they would think that because I used to think that, and especially when you're young, you know, and impressionable and all of that, you know, you really want to give it a all. It's not a bad thing to want to give it a, a, your all. It's not a bad thing to want to learn. And sometimes you will go above and beyond. And, but it has to be also a balance and, and reciprocated. I don't believe there is a defined, you know, I think it's very difficult in this day and age to say, you know, five on the dot, four, I don't know, whatever time it may be on the dot, it's done. There will always be some form of fluctuation situation to that, whether if you're living early or you're living later or on time, there will be certain degrees of fluctuation. I think where the difference comes when it comes to our mental health is the frequency of that happening. So it's one thing to have it every now and then, you know, it's another thing to have it constant because, you know, there is simply too much to do and there isn't enough capacity. So there you have to ask yourself if that's the case, you know, is the business able to get more capacity on board or do I need to move on and find a place that has a better working capacity in that respect? 
Or if you expect flexibility from the employer and every now and then there's a situation where, I don't know, something comes up and everyone stays late and they do it together. But then when you have something that is that support, you won't look at it that way anymore, would you? Mm -hmm. Because you know that when you need it, you have that support from the employer. So I think rather than looking at hours per se in terms of the time indicator, you look at the balance and the value and the support that you get in return as well. Naturally, with a medical profession, I don't think it's that simple. So you <laughs> can tell us. No, I, I mean, I don't think it's that simple. I'm speaking here, you know, as I said, from my experience in, in from the office setup. But I think with the medical profession, it's a bit more complicated because if you're on the ward, you're on the ward, right? <laughs> um, so my my first thought to to your question is is actually the importance of boundaries. So I agree that you know, with us, work is twenty four seven. Hospital doesn't close. Patients keep coming, but I'm not, as in there, when I'm home, there is someone doing my job and it is up to me to say, you know, I'm home, this is my off time, I need to rest because that is a part of my job. And at that time, there is someone else doing my job. So I think boundary is really the, the key term. So even when it comes to from the employer, so if I'm meant to be working a certain shift, and if I'm getting paid to work a certain shift, I'm, I would like to, or if I need to stay over time for the patient, I have done it before, but then if no one's no one's going to thank you for it, you know, like your employer is not going to re recognize you. So I think the thing you said about value. So if I'm working with someone and they're really appreciating my, my contribution, that's one thing. But if you're working and you're giving it your all for, for, a, for anything, for an organization, for a company, and you don't get anything in return, I think that's when you start to get burnt out. And that's really when you have to be aware of your boundaries. Yeah, just like any relationship, really, even in a romantic relationship, if I feel like I'm giving too much, but mm -hmm. I'm not getting enough in return, then I will be dissatisfied with my relationship. And I think it's the same at work. If I know that my employer or my colleagues are willing to support me, then I would want to support them, even if they don't ask me, yeah. probably. So I would take initiative. But if I feel like everyone is doing their bit and just that, and it's like, everyone has a ruler and they're measuring every single <laughs> yes, thing yes. they're doing then I will probably do the same because at the end of the day we're all human and we all get tired and frustrated and, and it just feels unfair so definitely I agree it's complicated isn't it <laughs> it is complicated and I think Fran you hit the nail right on the head there because income rely is reliant on your your work environment whether you're a ceo or whether you're you know, someone who's just starting out in in the workplace you have that added pressure that of course if you walk away from a loved one or you know a relationship or whatever there's repercussions but it's usually not likely that you would lose your income from that yeah, exactly. and it means i believe that we tolerate an awful lot more in the workplace than we would from anywhere else I want to, before we come to dealing with specifics, uh, I want to just ask a question because this one is for you, Fran, because, uh, and possibly, I actually, you know, to be quite honest with you, I'm going to ask it to, to, to everyone at the table because it will be interesting to see what the, the, the feedback is that. Um, media channels are full of stories at the moment of Gen Z and millennials complaining about the workplace conditions in situations that some would really question as being entitled or unrealistic. For instance, TikTok uh, still feeds me with this story of a young woman who declared that she was bullied at work because of her problem with time blindness. Uh, and a lot of people came back and said, uh, how can you not use an alarm clock? She was complaining about the fact that she had time blindness and therefore that was her excuse for not turning up at work on time. How do we identify real workplace issues and occasions when we should just get on with it as part of our workplace expectations. How do we define the difference? It will open a whole Pandora. <laughs> I know, that's why I'm looking that's, that's at you, Fran, because I knew you'd have an opinion about this. 
I think the first thing to 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 look at is to look at it through you know reasonable expectation. You know, so even if you go to court, for example, if you're in trouble with mm-hmm. something, you know, usually the law would look at it through the reasonable expe- what is reasonable for the layman. Okay, so in the example that you gave, you know, with time blindness, so I assume that means just to make sure I understand correctly is that there is no perception of time. So that makes it difficult for the person to know, you know, when to wake up, the times and you know, but at the same time, we also have to realize that. I, I'm just going to interject. It was on TikTok, so it's incredibly difficult to work that to one out. Work that one out. <laughs> I, I would assume. Yes, is it a diagnosis? I, it's, inferring it's, from yes, this, I, um, I would assume. I mean, it's it is it's not a diagnosis in itself. It's it's I guess a symptom or a sign of conditions like ADHD. Sure, 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 so, sure. So sure, yes, sure. it is. Where the perception of time, perhaps it would be different, you know, we, we, they lose track. Okay, so it has to do with timing issues. But it's also important to understand that in the context of, of, of work, you know, job and business, it is a contract, okay? A contract of services, if you will, a contract of employee, you call it whatever you want, an agreement, whatever you want to call it. Whereas a business pays in order to receive an expertise. So it's also important to understand that. So when we deal with things like this, like you said, you know, if the person is struggling, you can propose solutions. So, for example, in the case that you gave, like you said, you know, an alarm clock, you know, maybe does she not have the funds, you know, is there any support that the person would need? But we have to take a a very reasonable degree of responsibility. We cannot shout, um, you know discrimination thing on things that are also in our control because we are responsible also for conducting ourselves, regulating ourselves and providing value in exchange for the payment we get. Now, we may disagree whether that value mm-hmm. is fair or not, but also it is within our means in some instances, not in all, but particularly we're talking in the context of developed countries, it is within our means to make changes that would make that situation better as well. We just need the courage and the right information. So I'm a big fan of balancing things out and supporting, but we also have to be very aware of how that impacts the people around us as well because if you are constantly late but you're not putting for example mechanism in place to mitigate that then your colleagues are suffering because they have to pick up the work then that's not fair towards them forget the business okay let's assume everyone is against businesses against employers a big bad wolf right but what about your colleagues have you thought how that impacts them okay and other things like this so there has to be um, and I was thinking when I was coming here, I was actually talking to to my husband, um, particularly exactly about this, because when it comes, for example, um, to um, ADHD, for example, so there are varying degrees and so on and so forth. And um, someone who said, you know, this material gives me the ache, you know, it's like my ADHD sensory issues. Whereas, for example, I have sensory issues with regards to certain materials and shapes, particularly holes. <laughs> Anyway, you see, they particularly make, what? Make, what? Uh, particularly holes, like designs with holes in the wall, multi stone. Oh my gosh! Yes, I don't know where it came from. I have no idea what's going on. Didn't have it till I was about 30. All of a sudden, I realized certain patterns and textures really make me violently throw up. So it's very different, you know, in that respect. So it's also important to distinguish these degrees. I'm giving you a very extreme example with perhaps an example that's very fashionable to pick up on. But I'm trying to make a point that it's important to distinguish between this, but it's also important to regulate ourselves and to carry responsibilities for our actions as well. You have two sense. ladies that can help you with that. <laughs> with, <laughs> I, that was mind blowing. I don't know where it came from. Thirty, all of a sudden, oh, oh, oh what's going on? I well, you, you know, I had to leave a meeting once because the pattern on the wall was with uh, I forgot how it's called, trick or whatever. I don't know. I never knew, and I started getting really, really, really sick. And I was like, I need to leave. I need to leave. I need to it's, leave. it's a massive aside, but I'm just going to say. 
I there's a particular feta cheese that has a plastic wrapper, and that type of plastic really upsets me. I and that was a thirty year old thing, right? We'll come to that. It's a whole different show. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, materials. Oh. But but and I'm going to come to you in a second, Nicole, because I have a very poignant question for you. But but Claire, how do we distinguish with between what is a real workplace mental health challenge and when you just should get on with it? It's very difficult to do because we don't see life in the same way. Our perception of things is very different. But as um, you were saying, like even with ADHD, for example, I feel like... um, I I would want someone to support me and to empower me. So if I decide to do something about it, then I can feel more empowered. So I think it's about how we tackle these issues at work. So maybe I think that time blindness, I don't know, doesn't exist or that you made it up or maybe I don't know. It was on TikTok, Claire. (laughs) Of course it exists. (laughs) Um, Sure, but let's say I don't know enough about it because obviously no one knows everything. So let's say I I don't know anything about it and I'm the employer. Maybe we can have a chat about it and maybe I can try to responsibilize you, but through empowerment. So rather than yelling at you and saying, you know, this is stupid or um, I've never experienced this at the place of work. You're the only one, you know, who's coming up with this term. Maybe I can suggest different ways of working around it. And then maybe we can talk about the progress. And if you are making progress, then I'll be happy and hopefully you'll be happy and your colleagues will be happy as well. And I, I think sometimes it's just about reframing things. So rather than looking at it as a problem necessarily, although it might be, we can look at it as an opportunity. So maybe we can learn something new or maybe there's a new routine that you could try doing, perhaps. Agreed. But that's the ideal work environment yes, where somebody sure, is sure. going to give you the time and space to yes, to explore. Sure. And I'm coming back to Nicole because I have a feeling that the medical profession, with all of the pressure, pressures that it has, with the fast pace that it has, with the extremities that it has, potentially doesn't have room for issues like that. So I have a two-phase question for you. there's probably a lot of people that want to be involved in the medical profession that may not be able to because simply because they have these exceptions, whether it be ADHD, whether it, and we talked about ADHD a lot, or maybe there are other issues that are facing them. How does the medical profession itself cater for people with those challenges? And also, you know, I'm going to come back to the fact that, that our younger generations have a, a lot of bad press, quite frankly, that they, you know, are not resilient and don't have the resources to, uh, in themselves, to be able to maintain a, a good working relationship under pressure. But if we don't have young people in the medical profession, we're screwed when we get older. You know what I'm saying? We need young people. Yeah. So again, is there a place for young people in the medical profession? How resilient really are they? <laughs> Okay, so very a very loaded question. I know. <laughs> I feel like Sorry. I'm in my, in my fifth year medical exams, you know, being grilled by an examiner. <laughs> so good job. I will be marking. Making, making me feel at home. <laughs> um, okay, so with regards to question one, which is the medical profession and the mental health difficulties or stuff like ADHD, autism and stuff like that. So um I believe, actually, wait, (laughs) how am I going to word this? Okay, so a lot of doctors have mental health conditions. A lot of doctors have autism, ADHD. There's actually a group called Autistic Doctors International, which is a group of doctors who are autistic. Um, So it's actually something which is, I mean, quite common, I would say. It may not be evident to, to, you know, the first person on, on the street, but it's, I mean, yes, I mean, I think you can, uh, anyone can become a doctor, you know, if they work hard enough. It might not, it might be easier for me than it is for someone else, possibly. But, I mean, I don't think having a mental health condition or a neurodivergence, which is what ADHD and autism would be, um, would exclude you from becoming a doctor. Okay. That's question one. (laughs) That is question one. You've got a 10 out of 10 for that, thanks. (laughs) 
Um, so question two with regards to resilience. Um, I, mean, I think the majority of, of doctors are, are young. I mean, I'm not sure what, what the cutoff for young is, but <laughs> I mean, we graduate, the ma- let's say the majority graduate at age 23. So you know, the people on the, on the wards day in, day out are up to 35, maybe. I, it's, it's an, uh, I mean, it's, it's a generalization. and I'm sure some people will probably say something about this, but the majority are, are young. Um, and we are already resilient. You know, we've done medical school. We've dealt with a lot of things, you know, even, even teenage years require resilience. It doesn't have to be a difficult <laughs> university course. I think, I think people, I don't know, I don't agree with the fact that young people aren't resilient. I think we're very resilient for the world, today's world and today's challenges. <laughs> and I have to say, my question was about, really about the stigma of young people. But young people are getting a bit of flack right now. They, they mm. are getting a, a bit of flack for raising issues about mm. you know, situations. And maybe, maybe they're actually seeing things more clearly than mm. we are. And we've put up with crap for far too long, but but it's a good it's a good message to hear that young people are coming into the medical profession, and that you know it, it really is. It it sounds like it's a young person's game, quite frankly, to work those hours and not go to the toilet for twelve hours or whatever like that. <laughs> it's not something I want to face. <laughs> I like the fact that Fran's going. No, not me either. Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, I can't believe it, but we are coming to the end of this show. So I I feel like we've kind of only brushed the, the surface of this and we've got an awful lot more that we'll talk about and so we will do it again. But I'm going to ask each of you uh, to close, to, to, to offer a word of advice. I think, first of all, from, from my point of view, that anybody's listening to this situation, even just simply looking at the statistics, if you're having a challenge in the workplace, you are not on your own. If you are simply not being able to separate home life from work life because you're, as you said, always available. If you're dealing with a toxic relationship, you know, as you said, that that's surmountable to a dealing with a toxic relationship in your personal life. And as you said, good grief, you, you know, in the medical profession, you're working these extraordinary hours. So I'm going to ask each of you to, to give a closing thought, to give some advice to anybody who is facing challenges in their work environment at the moment. What can they do and what should they do? Mm-hmm. First of all, I think it's important to speak to someone about it, anyone, even if it's a friend initially or a parent or a partner, and then maybe try to speak to someone at work. Um, there are a lot of companies in Malta who have employee assistant, uh, assistance programs as well. So I would also encourage anyone to make sure that if there is this kind of opportunity that they make use of it, because I meet a lot of clients who don't even know that they have this opportunity opportunity to seek help, to go to therapy, and um, usually in these um, services, uh, therapy is paid by the employer. So um, yes, this is even offered wow. by Richmond as well. And yes, so uh, first of all, I would, I would encourage them to check this out, even if their company offers health insurance, which they would be able to use to seek support. There are public services, of course, but some people might want to go um, to a private uh, professional and um, in private practice. So um, check them out, that's what I would say. And then I think if you've exhausted all options, you know, if you've, if you've tried to speak to your colleagues or the management, if you've tried to change certain things from your end or whatever, if you've exhausted all options, then the best thing to do would be to put your mental health first, maybe not leave, uh, the workplace immediately because as we were saying um, there are a lot of responsibilities and commitments that one would have so that doesn't make it easy but I would always say if you are noticing symptoms of burnout 
start looking for a job, even if you don't apply or if you apply, you get chosen and you don't go for it. Because by the end of it, if you're completely and utterly burnt out, you won't have the stamina, the energy um, and the confidence to apply for jobs, go for interviews. How can you do that if you're completely burnt out, if you feel useless? Um, so start looking, but discuss it with someone. Um, you would need to evaluate pros and cons of course, but start looking before um, you reach that point, because then it might be a bit too late, unfortunately. That's mm. bloody good advice, Claire. <laughs> Fran, you got to follow that one. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be hard, but I do, I do agree with Claire. It's important to understand the options that are available to you in terms of a support. Um, what I, I always recommend people to do when they find themselves close to burnout or stressed or generally overwhelmed uh, by their work situation that uh, causes them uh, mental health challenges like anxiety, depression, and so on and so forth, is to identify first what is the main trigger? Because it could be the environment a trigger. It could be, you know, a colleague. It could be the workload. It could be it could be a lot of things. But you need to be able to name it. Then you can see if there is an opportunity for you to improve that. Like Claire said, through discussions, is there anything that the company can assist you with? If there, if it, if it's not possible to assist, it maybe you can suggest something. So again, we're going back to communication, being open, but also being open from your end to seek resolution because ultimately the power lies with you mm. um, ultimately i know it's hard because then you feel even greater responsibility and a lot more stress but it is true you have to identify that and see what your options are if you can improve it or is it a case if you have to find a place that is more in line with how you see your career and your style of working as well because we all have different styles of working so identify what works, what doesn't, and what doesn't. See if you can address it, if you can find support. If not, then you know you need to, to look at places. And that's a great thing to do because then when you do look for a job, you'll know what to look at so you don't repeat the same mistake. Like relationships, you know, break up is like, you know, <laughs> find it the same one is like, oh my God, you're twins or what, <laughs> you're right? <laughs> so, so by identifying that, it will help you ideally to avoid that mistake or address the mistake. I love what made. you just said there about identifying uh, where the problem is and, and avoiding repetition of making the same mistake. That's absolutely fantastic. Nicole, I'm coming to you for the last word because you are so committed to this within your profession that you and your wonderful friend Maria uh, decided that you were going to go to Everest Base Camp, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. You have identified that this is such an issue that you will go that far yeah. to bringing awareness to it. So for your profession, what it be, and I mention that because I'm pretty sure that whatever you're going to say has connotations for <laughs> everybody. But what are your closing words? What are your closing thoughts? You, you're that committed to it. Um, so I think uh, now that you've mentioned base camp, I think for both me and Maria, climb, the the sort of imagery or or metaphor of climbing a mountain is is quite. Um, like it's very symbolic for us in the sense that whenever you have a challenge, be it a mental health challenge or a challenge in anything else, it's going to feel like a mountain. It's going to feel like this huge thing which you can't really, which you can't really climb. But in truth, um, my uh, my uh, friend uh, says that you know, like everything, this point is a moment in time. So what you're experiencing is temporary. So. It might suck, it might suck a lot right now, but it will pass. You know, it, it might not get great immediately, but you know, there are things we can do and there is help. So I think that is my closing comment. <laughs> Fantastic. Ladies, thank you so, so much for coming to this show to address something that is so common and empowering women by just openly talking about it.